All right. Here we are for Honors Physics, taking a look at uh, circular motion and universal gravitation, uh, worksheet one. Uh, we're going to take a look at problem two here, okay, which says a 1,500 kilogram car is on a road that makes a rather tight right turn. The turn in the road has a radius of 70 meters. The road is not banked. Uh, that means that the ground isn't sloped. It's, it's horizontal. Um, and the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the road is 0.8. Can you determine the maximum speed the car can have without sliding off the road? And uh, if we had a 2,000 kilogram car instead of a 1,500 kilogram car, make the same turn, how will its maximum speed compare to the maximum speed for the smaller, lighter car? All righty. So uh, <clears throat> circular motion problem. You say, we, of course, are going to start with doing uh, a, ske a sketch or two. We recall that in circular motion, um, Oftentimes our problems become very three-dimensional, and so we want to draw um, views down multiple axes so we can see all three uh, axes, analyze all three. So here we go, car making a tight right turn. So I'm going to draw um, this first view. I'm going to draw down the Z axis. Remember, we're going to use radial, tangential, and Z axes for our three axes. Okay, the Z axis is the one that lets you see the circular path. Okay, so looking... Uh, in this case, we'll be looking down on the car um, as it drives along the section of road. Right, my circular path, right? Uh, I know, not, not a great circle I'm drawing here, but uh, what are you going to do? Anyway, um, so like here's my car. All right, I guess it's a one-lane road because I'm driving down the middle of the road. Uh, but here we go. Uh, headlights, right? We're driving that way. Our velocity would be uh, in this direction. Yeah. Right, and then the so this is looking down the z-axis. The other axis I like to always draw is the tangent, looking down the tangential axis. Now, tangent to the path, that's this way. That's the way the velocity is, right? Always. So I like to draw the picture looking from behind. So in the picture, I'll see the object moving away from me into the page. And so I'll draw that right underneath here. So it kind of lines up. So here is the ground. And here I'm going to see that car, right? So here will be like the rear bumper and the tires, right? And uh, in there into the back trunk and uh, looking through the back windshield. I don't know, license plate. Yeah, we're all good. Okay, tail light. Hey, there's my car. All right, so that's the sketch, right? So I drew one looking down the z-axis and I drew a picture looking along the tangential axis. Okay. Um, Probably a good idea to get the coordinate axes kind of settled and straight in our head. So I'm going to kind of draw the axes off to the side. Um, clearly, uh, this is tangent to the path, right? Here's the circular path, tangent. Tangential is going to go up and down. I'm going to draw my axes over here. Okay, that's my tangential axis. Now, radial goes along the radius of the circle. So it's along the line towards the center of the circle, circular path. So it's gonna be this way. So here is my radial axis for this picture. All right. Now the third dimension, the Z axis, that's when we're looking down, so we're not gonna see it there. Take a look at the car um, here in this picture now. This is the one where we're looking along the tangential axis. So it's going kind of in the page, away from us is the way that the car is going, right? If I drew a line up and down, what act? Oh, I didn't mean to draw on top of the sketch. Whoops, over here. Uh, whoops. Uh, hey, what axis is that? You say, well, that's not the one that's tangent. We're looking down the tangent. The center of the circle, it's over here now, isn't it? So this way is the radial axis. So it's horizontal in this picture, too. This is that third dimension. That's the Z. This up and down, that's the Z axis. And I wish I had not uh, done that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, there. Easily fixed. No one would ever know, right? Did I head box that up? There we go. There. See? Perfect. Sure, you say. Okay. Uh, anyway, moving onward. So those are our axes. 
Um, let's go ahead now and do our free body diagrams. Now, uh, technically, you're supposed to draw new free body diagrams. I'm just going to draw right on the sketch, if you don't mind, uh, for this first couple problems. All right. Um, I really should draw a new picture, um, but a new free body diagram instead of drawing on the sketch. But yeah, I'm going to do that for the first few problems here. So, okay, uh, running through. So we're going to find forces the same way we always find forces, running through the same kind of sequence of questions. First, we ask what ranged forces are acting. And you would say, oh, gravitational force. The Earth is pulling down on this thing. So I'm not going to see that gravitational force arrow in this top picture. It's like a top-down view. Gravity would be going straight into the page away from me, right? So I won't see it there. But I will see the gravitational force arrow on this rear view, looking down the tangential axis. So it'd have mg there, yeah? All right. That's it for ranged forces. Now we go to contact forces. So you say, okay, well, what's touching the car? Well, the only thing touching the car is the road, right? Okay. And so you ask, are they being pressed together? And you'd say, sure, gravity is shoving into the road, so the road will push back up. Now, you know how there's like four tires touching the ground? Am I going to draw four little normal forces? Now, let's just draw one normal force to represent all that normal force from the ground, okay? So one arrow from the ground going upward, okay? And that's my normal force on the car by the road. And so you say, okay, um, I'm not going to see that normal force in this diagram because the normal force is going out of the page in this picture. Uh, it's going straight out of, the, out of the road. Okay, now that we have a normal force, we could have a friction force maybe. So we ask, once I have surfaces being pressed together, we ask, are those surfaces trying to slide past each other? All right. And in this case, you say the answer is going to be a yes. There's a definite friction force here between the car and the road, or right, between those tires and the road. And so you say, well, um, let's, we're going to about to put the friction force on. Let's hold off a second on that, though. Um, once we've done that, there's nothing else touching this car except the road. So once we put this friction force on, we're done. That's the last force in this problem. So, you, so we think about which way the friction force has to go. Well, we know it's going to be along the surface, along the road, right? Okay, so we know we're going to see it kind of going this way along the surface, right? And you say, but remember, we're going in a circle, which means we need to have force in the radial direction, tugging us in towards the center of the circle. That means that friction force is going to need to have at least a component inward, right? At least it's going to have to have a component that way. Now you say, now wait, uh, it could be going at an angle like that, kind of forward a little bit. It still have a component inward, or it could be angled back a little bit, right? And we'd still have, right? So it'd still be along the surface of the road, but we could have components forward or backward a tangential component. But in this problem, right, we are considering this to be going at constant speed around, not getting faster or getting slower. All right, that should have been stated more clearly in the problem. Uh, but the point is we're going at a constant speed. All right, we're trying to find the maximum speed we can go at and make it around. Okay, that assume it's a constant maximum speed. So you're saying, if I'm going at a constant speed, then I don't want to have an acceleration in the tangential axis. And so I don't want to have a net force, a uh, total force that's going in that axis. At this point, we realize there's no other forces. We don't have anything going tangent. If I gave that friction a component forward or backward, then it would be changing the speed of the car. And we want this to be going at constant speed. We're actually, because we're trying to find the maximum speed we can go at without sliding off the road. We're going to want all of that friction helping us to turn, all of that friction going into the center. So our friction force, as strange as it might sound, is going to be directed right toward the center of the circle. It's all in the radial direction. Okay, And I'll see that here too, that friction force along the surface of the ground, heading inward toward the center of the circle. So I'll see that in both pictures. The radial axis shows up in both pictures, both diagrams. 
All right. Um, for me, this problem is one that I can still remember from high school when I first was learning physics, that this was a problem that I did not understand specifically why the static friction was directed that way. Um, this is uh, my best explanation at this point, um, having had some more time to think about this problem uh, since I was in high school. Uh, I recognize that because we're looking at this at the very limit, we want all that friction to be helping us turn. There's no tangential friction uh, for this problem. We want all that friction to be helping us turn. We're trying to find the very fastest we can go, so we want all of the friction force helping us turn. Make sense? Okay, so that's it. Okay, and there's nothing else to balance it out. We wouldn't be going constant speed if we had a tangential component. Okay, that's it. Um, moving onward. Um, I guess uh, the only other thing would be if I wanted to talk about why it's a static friction force and not like kinetic friction maybe or something. Um, that's a discussion that uh, we've had back in the friction unit about how rolling motion works if I have something rolling along and not slipping. Um, I guess I'll say a quick couple words about that just to be on the safe side. Um, hey, you know that when a person walks? Okay, you know what this is, right? Uh, you do now, right? Okay, say someone's walking along, yeah? Then you know that the way you walk forward you put your foot down and you push backwards with your foot, don't you? Like you're trying to slide your foot back on the ground. But friction opposes sliding and says, no, no, no. And static friction is actually the force that drives you forward, right? Okay. What happens if you had wet ice here, right? And you put your foot down and you try to walk forward. Your foot would just slip back, wouldn't it? Because you are trying to slide your foot back, you're pushing against the ground that way, and friction drives you forward, opposing the slide. That's how you walk. If you didn't have any friction between you and the ground, you couldn't get anywhere. You wouldn't be able to walk anywhere. So static friction is what drives us forward. The same thing happens with tires, okay? If I have a wheel, right, and it'd be kind of squished a little bit there, actually, from the weight of the car pushing down on, on that tire, right? Okay, if I'm trying to go forward, I'm going to spin my wheel this way. Yeah? What's happening at the surface here? Well, that tire is attempting to slip backwards there. Do you see what I'm saying? It's trying to turn and slip back here. Static friction fights against the slide and pushes forward on that surface of the tire, driving you forward. So static friction is the force that drives you along if you're just doing a nice smooth roll. Now, if you had, if you didn't have enough friction there, right? It's like say you hit a wet patch, wet, 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 or slippery ice, then your tires will spin in place, right? Then they're sliding. Then it's just kinetic friction driving it forward. But static friction uh, is what we typically have for rolling motion, and that's why we're talking about static friction here. Okay, just a quick reminder on that. Let's continue with the problem. Okay, so here we have our force diagrams. Now we're ready to go and use the most important formula in physics. That's right, sigma f equals ma, Newton's second law of motion. We're going to apply that to each axis. So I'll look at the sum of the forces in the radial axis. We will always analyze the radial axis in a circular motion problem. Um, and then we'll look at, now, do you notice that there's no forces in the tangential? Yeah. So let's, we're, I'm not even going to bother writing it out. I know I'd have zero force, and so I'll have zero acceleration in the tangential. We will look at the z, though. So the force in the z is mass times acceleration in the z. OK, let's uh, put in our labels from our force diagram. Remember that for the radial axis, which way has to be the positive direction? You don't have a choice. Inward toward the center of the circle is always positive. So our radial positive will be to the right. Which way do you want to call positive for the z? Yeah, let's not be weird. Let's call up out of the surface positive. So those will be our positive directions. For the tangential, let's say that the way we're going is positive. So those would be the positives on that axis. So when I do the radial, we always call positive in towards the center. Okay, And this is the most common mistake in circular motion problems that people have when they're first learning. Is they'll forget, even when they're not first learning, they'll forget that you don't have an option which way is positive for radial. Inward toward the center has to be the positive direction. 
So I'll be doing forces in minus forces out. Or if you want to use fancy terms, the centripetal toward the center forces minus the centrifugal away from the center forces. In our case, in the radial, there's only one force uh, in toward the center, static friction. So we'll have static friction equals mass times my acceleration in the radial. Now, our acceleration in this axis will always be towards the center, inward, to make you turn that way, right? And so towards the center, that's what we call the centripetal acceleration. So that's AC every time for the radial axis. All right, um, taking a look at this, you say, uh, let's do the same thing here for the Z axis. I'll do, uh, we're gonna do forces up minus down. And so in the Z, it looks like I just have normal minus mg is mass times the acceleration in the Z. You say, but wait a minute, is this car accelerating up and down? And you say, no. So that acceleration in the Z in this problem is zero. So there are my, there I am, uh, my equations for substituting into Newton's second law of motion using the labels from my force diagram. Remember, we always want to see these equations written out with just the labels from the diagram, no numbers yet. Because there's a lot of good physics that went into getting this far, this is a good spot to stop and check your understanding of the problem. Make sure you got to this line, uh, these lines. Um, after this point, there's very little physics left. It's mostly algebra. There's, a, there's some physics left in this one, but uh, not too much, not too much. All right, continuing with that. We are trying to find the maximum speed that we can uh, make this turn at. And the way we're going to get that is the fact that we have a formula for centripetal acceleration, don't we? That's the centripetal acceleration is speed squared over the radius. So we're going to substitute that in here. And you feel good about that because that gets you the variable we're trying to solve for, which we didn't have yet. Now, they didn't tell us the force of static friction. Instead, they told us the coefficient of friction was 0.8. The coefficient of friction, that is not F, that is mu, right? We're gonna go ahead and say, well, with static friction, you remember, static friction can be any value up to a maximum. We are trying to find the very fastest we can make it around this curve. So we want all as much friction as we can, as much force toward the center as we can to help us make that turn. So we will be having the static friction at its max value. Right, so I'll be so that means uh, since static friction is any value up to mu s n, right? If we're at the max, that's when it's equal to mu s n, and that is what we have here the maximum value. So I can substitute that in. All right, um, I know mu, I know m, I know r, mu n. I just don't know n, right? And I'm trying to find v. So I have two unknowns, n and v. I can get rid of n by substituting from this. n is mg. So I could go ahead and take this and substitute it in where I see n there. So I will have mu s and then my substituted value, mg. And of course, sharp-eyed viewers will say, hey, I see there's an M in every term of the equation. And that means those masses will just drop out. I can divide it through by M and all the M's go away. And so I just have mu G is V squared over R. I know mu, I know G, I know R. I can solve for V, okay? Be oh, I should have pointed out, because this is the maximum static friction, we are at the maximum speed, right? Uh, which is what we're trying to find. Uh, rearranging uh, one last time. Yeah, yeah, one last time. We've got mu s times g times r, <laughs> right? Uh, equal to v squared, right? And you say, well, then I'll just take a square root of both sides. And that's what we've got. So we've got that, that uh, maximum v, right? is the square root of muger, right? And uh, I can go ahead and put in my values. That will look something like this. The root of, let's see here, they told you the coefficient of static friction was 0.8. We know that G is 
We know the radius of the turn is 70 meters. We can solve for that maximum speed. Time for the calculator. And so I'll say, okay, 0.8, oops, 0.8 times 9.8 times 70. And I'll take a square root of that answer. And I get 23.4 meters per second. All right, and that's my answer. Okay. Um, as you know, uh, we like to use variables throughout. And so at the end is when we need to put a variable, a unit on. We don't put units on variables. We just put units on numbers. Um, we're going to 23.4. It's a velocity. As long as I'm using the standard metric units throughout, um, newtons, kilograms, meters, seconds, then my answer for velocity will come out to be meters per second. So that's it. Okay. And that's, that's part A. Now, part B says, okay, great. Now we have a different mass car. So instead of having a 1500 kilogram car, now we send a 2000 kilogram car around the same turn. How will its maximum speed compare to that of the 1500 kilogram car? In other words, we're making the mass bigger. What effect will that have on this V? And you say, well, wait a second. The mass dropped out of the calculation. There's no ma mass does not affect that maximum speed. So the max speed will be the same. The same for any mass vehicle. As long as what here is a property of the car, that's a property of the turn, that's a property of the, you know, no matter what you have, G is 9.8. But this mu, we might have, if you had different tires, different material, right? Different coefficient of friction for your tires, then that would affect things. But otherwise, every vehicle, it will have the same max velocity to go around that curve. Okay? Okay, because mass dropped out of the calculation, right? Okay. You say, why did it drop out anyway? Well, because friction is the force helping us turn. We know that the more massive you are, the more mass you have, the more inertia you have, the harder it is to change your velocity, to bend your path. But the more massive you are, the harder you're being pulled into the ground by gravity. And so the more normal force you have, so the more friction force you have. If I had twice the mass, I would have twice the friction force. And if I had twice the friction force, but I also have twice the mass, I needed twice the force because of F equals MA. You see the mass shows on both sides, perfectly balances, we're great, okay? Twice the mass, we need tw twice the inertia, twice as hard to turn, but we get twice the friction force because we're getting shoved into the ground twice as hard. It all balances out perfectly, so mass drops out, all right? That's problem number two.